who here has heard of PFAS or PFAS molecules before? So many people in the crowd are familiar with uh, this, uh, this very useful, however hi highly contaminative uh, um, man-made molecule and that we have used to um, pollute our planet at this point. So we're going to talk a little bit about why this particular set of research is important first and then the steps that we've gone through so far um, in order to try to understand some of the cleanup activities. Um, this work was conducted, um, it's been going on for the past couple of years. We've worked with Irish Center for High-End Computing and some of the fabulous chemists there, as well as some folks who couldn't be here today from Accenture, um, Hassan Naziri and uh, Alberto Garcia, who are some of uh, the folks who know much more of the details about the intricacies of this than I do, but I'm going to use some notes and try and get through it. Um, okay, so PFAS. It's a set of chemicals that we have now introduced into our water supply around the globe. Uh, they're bioaccumulative, so they, every time that you uh, ingest any of them, they continue to uh, remain in your system. Uh, they can be passed on from you to your, your children as well, and it's a, it's a big challenge. We've discovered them. Um, uh, oh, one other thing about this presentation. So this is actually an interactive website, but because we don't have uh, interactivity up here, we just put slide versions of it. But this slider shows the prevalence of discovering PFAS all around the globe. Um, I'm from Michigan, which is one of the hot spots for, for PFAS contamination. Uh, and so it's near and dear to my heart that we investigate this particular set of, of molecules and figure out how to degrade them or because they're non-biodegradable and bioaccumulative and affecting many different parts of our um, supply chain. So what is PFAS or where is it? Um, you can find PFAS in many different types of products today, or well, less so now than, than, what, um, than what maybe we had growing up. I would say, so who here went to Blockbuster growing up and maybe rented a movie? Probably most of you. And did you enjoy microwave popcorn, perhaps, when you were watching this movie at home, maybe during uh, you know, the 90s or the early 2000s? Well, you, in that process of popping that microwave popcorn, there's a nonstick um, uh, in, uh, film inside of the microwave bags, and that was actually using some of the PFAS chemicals. And it was one of the most, um, the easiest ways to get PFAS into your system because the heat of the microwave um, released it into the popcorn. And so the entire population of the world today has some form of PFAS in them already, all of us in this room. They had to go back to, I think, some World War I uh, archive of, of blood samples to find people who didn't have it. Uh, so don't think you're not affected by this problem. There's many other ways, uh, uh, many other products that um, that this was used for. Nonstick pans is another popular one. Perfectly safe if you discard your pan before it gets any scratches or dings. But as soon as you're cooking with a, a you know a, a pan like that, then you can get it in your system. Carpets. So you imagine kids playing on your carpet. They can be coated with it. Your shoes as a water resistant source. One of the biggest places that you find it is. Uh, on military bases where they use it as a firefighting foam protectant and that was one of the easiest ways for it to get entered into the water supply as well. And so tons of different uses, obviously a very uh, you know, useful material until we find out that it is, has negative effects on the human. Some examples of the, the PFAS cycle here. So it can be released in manufacturing in the water supply. It can be put into landfills and then leach out from the landfills into the water supply. Uh, and the challenges of filtering PFAS out of the water supply is actually very difficult. So they have these um, carbon granulated filters that can get some sizes of different PFAS molecules out, but there are smaller PFAS molecules that can't be filtered. I think Oh, there's a total of over 4,000 now different variations of PFAS or PFAS or PFOA molecules that are out there in the world right now. And um, even if you're able to collect them, you still have the problem of disposing of them and breaking them down in a, in a way that is, um, that is 
efficient, uh, and and um, and, and this is a, a big challenge. There's not really a, a ready way that is real world deployable, cost effective, and, and zero waste related. So you can bury them for a future generation to deal with. It's a little too costly to launch them in the space, but there's really no solution for us to um, degrade them in an, an efficient manner at scale. Because you're talking about you know, filtering the Great Lakes, <laughs> which is not, not really plausible. Again, how does it affect human health? So most of it, uh, many of it is related to pregnancy-induced hypertension or preeclampsia. Uh, it can also cause thyroid cancer and, and many other reproductive diseases and challenges. And so over the years, it went from X amount of part per million to X amount of part per trillions uh, that were okay for human ingestion to now um, they're just saying zero uh, tolerance on it. And so the objective is to you know, efficiently get rid of it. The problem is, is that we don't have the chemistry today in order to model these sets of molecules efficiently in order to, um, to destroy them. And so uh, what we've been doing is building a, a workflow that allows us to analyze these molecules and plan and prepare to run them on future quantum computers, to run simulations of them, to run bond stretching and breaking simulations in order to figure out more efficient ways to uh, destroy them and break them down. And so um, a lot of the work that Accenture has been doing over the past several years is building what we call a DASC workflow. And what it does is it is based off of um, a configuration file that takes a molecule, the um, the variables that we want to explore, the different uh, uh, chemistry experiments that, that we want to run on it, and, um, and, and build um, a database of all of the things that we want to run on future quantum computers. And then what we started to do with iCheck was test out how different um, VQE formulations uh, can be created in order to test what was possible today and then also set up workflows like we did with INQ to run on the actual hardware that's available to, to understand how uh, we can uh, find ways to destroy this. And so this, again, just mentions some of the stuff that we started. This is an open collaboration that uh, anyone who's interested or wants to help can be involved in um, in order to experiment. And so here's one of the examples of, oh, I think I hit the button twice, let's see. Okay, here's one of the examples of uh, the front end. So you can see here, this was with uh, CH3F, so um, that would be fluoromethane. And we also did some H2 experiments in order to validate that the workflow uh, runs properly on, on INQ devices. This is a simulation that we did with iCheck. But you can see this is built on the, um, um, let me make sure I get this right. This is built on the bond stretching activities. So we, so we use VQE here. And the process is we, we select a specific molecule. We construct a, a Hamiltonian. And then we run Hartree-Fock in order to create a second quantization of the Hamiltonian. We apply active space approximation. And then transform to a qubit Hamiltonian using either Jordan Wigger or, or Bravi Gattaio in order to um, do that. Then we create a new onsatz and use tequila in our particular case with uh, iCheck to run the VQE until convergence. Um, and so that, that optimizes over a while. One other thing that was interesting during this is uh, we looked at Jordan Wigner and Bravi Gattaio as they were implemented in, in Circ and Open Fermion, and we were able to contribute some performance en enhancements back to that toolkit so that um, you know, future people using those uh, could uh, get better results. So we use ADAPT uh, UCCSD, and uh, here's some parameters for the ONSATs and the VQ optimizer. Um, you can see the disassociation curves that we were getting in some of the simulations. And uh, with that, I'll hand it off to you, Lumi, to um, tell us more. All right, All right. thanks, Carl. Uh, I'm going to continue the presentation. <laughs> OK, so, uh, so here, this, uh, this slide is about 
making sure that we have the optimal or most efficient circuit compilation so that we are able to run that circuit on today's quantum computers, especially on IonQ's trapped ion quantum computers. So at IonQ, we certainly put a lot of efforts into developing uh, like compilation of optimization techniques to make sure the circuit are efficient. This is achieved by like these different techniques. So first of all, we take advantage of the hardware layout. Uh, because, you know, as some of you might know, that the ion cubes, travel ion qubits, these qubits are all too well connected. And then when we design a circuit, we take that into account and we take advantage of that. One example would be if you look at this circuit, uh, so the, there are two uh, like circuits, um, and they're implementing the same unitary. So if you plug this in, uh, into like a Kiskis simulator, you, you compute a unitary, you'll find that they give you the same unitary. But then they're implemented differently. On the left, this one, it requires like all to all connect connectivity. So like, you have to entangle like the top qubit to the uh, bottom qubit. But then uh, the right one like assumes like a, a nearest neighbor connectivity. And then you may ask like why does it even matter? Because it has the same number of uh, like entangling gates and then single qubit gates here. Of course, it doesn't matter if you uh, only have one of them. But then this is actually uh, this particular like circuit actually is the core unit in the chemistry circuit, like in variational quantum, uh, variational quantum eigen solver. And then suppose you have a lot of these circuits and then attached to each other. And then in, the, uh, in between of them, you may have some basis transformations. And then if you do that, you will find that if you have the first layout, if you have all to all connect, uh, connectivity and you can implement the circuit in the, in, in the, in the first way, there will be a lot of seen on, uh, like entangling gate cancellation in between of these uh, like circuit blocks. But if you have the second one, the, the nearest neighbor like uh, implementation of the circuit, you'll find that you don't, you don't see these kind of signal cancellations. So that's where uh, the all to all connectivity is really like helping us in terms of developing uh, like optimizing circuit because it gives us uh, like more flexibilities of optimizing circuits. Okay, so once we do that, the second thing we do is to take advantage of the symmetry of the problem. As you might know that there are a, there are a lot of symmetries in chemistry problems, such as like particle number symmetry or point group symmetries, and we take advantage of that. So if if like if one like one particular term in your Anza design just violates the symmetry, it just doesn't give you the uh, the right symmetry that you want. We just don't you just don't need to implement that because it's not going to contribute to the energy, for example. So then we don't uh, we take symmetry into account, and once we have passed these two first these first two layers we pass the circuit into our like, in-house optimizer and, comp uh, and the compiler to further optimize the, uh, like, the circuit. And then doing so, we'll be able to achieve like, the maximum amount of like, entangling gate cancellation, which accounts for uh, the most of the noises in today's quantum computers. And then of course, today, if you are uh, if you're interested in learning more about these kind of circuit optimization techniques, you are always uh, feel free to uh, like, welcome to uh, look at this paper on the, uh, here. Uh, so like, I, like uh, on the bottom we said CPU and GPU vendors provide compilers that take advantage of their architectures and that's QPU vendors ourselves, we should do the same. So in order to quantify like, how efficient these circuits, these compiled circuits are, uh, here I just compare like, the number of two qubit gate depths, uh, the two qubit gate just, uh, just uh, C not gate, we compile everything to C not gate and then we compute the, uh, the, uh, the two qubit gate depths. Uh, for these uh, different kind of systems, uh, these are molecular systems uh, ranging from four, uh, four spin orbitals, that's four qubits, uh, up to 20 spin orbitals, that's 20, uh, uh, up to 30 spin orbitals, that's 30 uh, qubits. And then we compare like the same quantum chemistry algorithm, the unitary couple cluster with singles and doubles on the pretty widely used for BQE. And then we basically compare uh, these like the C naught, uh, like the two, uh, two qubit gate depths of the compiled circuit for that particular on dot of, across these different systems. For like uh, our compiler, with symmetry taking into account, without symmetry taking into account, and a naive implementation that you can find in like any of the standard uh, quantum chemistry or quantum computing simulation packages. And also uh, here, a ticket is a, a optimization techniques or optimization, circuit optimization and compilation uh, software package is open source. So we compare uh, the, C, the two qubit gate depths of these, of these uh, circuits and we find that our uh, 
uh, our optimization and the com uh, compilation techniques gave us the lowest number of two cubic gates, uh, two cubic uh, gate depths. Especially if you take into uh, take symmetry into account, you can see that it's like order of magnitude of uh, improvements versus the naive implementation in which you don't really take into account of qubit connectivity uh, or like symmetry of the problems. All right, so then uh, with this, uh, like the efficiently compiled and optimized circuits, I'm going to uh, talk a bit about the QP, uh, QP fast workflow. It is like a collaborative work done by Accenture, iCheck, and INQ. Uh, so basically, we provide this VQE toolbox so that a user can do end to end uh, like VQE executions. It does not really need you to have a, like a, uh, the users to have like a lot of knowledge in quantum computing. All you need to do is to uh, provide like an input file that specify the geometry, the structure of the molecule, the basis sets, um, some basic informations, and then that input file is submitted to the uh, to a HPC uh, scheduler, and it can be executed on classical HPC or uh, QPU back uh, QPU backend. And more importantly, like, if you want to use since we want to use the efficient like circuit compilation and generation of INQ quantum chemistry uh, soft, uh, packages, we interface that with the INQ uh, chemistry tools to give you the high, uh, high level access to the tailored or the optimized circuits. And we, this workflow has been validated on the simulation of the CF bond breaking, CF bond disassociation of methane fluoride, and we're working on, on the paper right now. So this would be like a very simplified version of the QP fast workflow, and then you see like a different different parts here, uh, and then most of them are pretty standard. We start from a specifying uh, you specify the molecule, the geometry, the charge, the spin multiplicity, and then the basis set, and then you just we just run like Hartree Fock uh, calculation to get uh, like molecular orbitals, and then we use uh, active space approximation, of course, because we don't really need uh, to simulate. All the, uh, all the electrons in, in the molecule, we select the active space, and then we give it to the, uh, to the uh, uh, liquid orbitals, the active space information, we generate a uh, effective Hamiltonian, and then you can do a, uh, we do qubit transformation uh, to transform that effective Hamiltonian to qubit, uh, to qubit Hamiltonian, and after we get this effective qubit Hamiltonian, we uh, specify the on dots, and then this, this way you can, you, can, uh, you can certainly interface that with any of the standard uh, software quantum chemistry simulation packages like Tequila, Open Fermion, which can give you some of the like UCCSD or pair UCCD type of onsaws, but they will not be as efficient as the, the compiled onsaws uh, that, uh, that are way optimized. Uh, so that in order to do that, you will need to uh, in interface with the ion cube chemistry tools. It will provide you optimal trapped ion circuit synthesis and then tailored compilation to native gate, uh, native gate stats and then it's capable of being executed on INQ QPU or, or cloud simulator. And then once you, uh, once you interface with the backend, you can just run the QE, use your classical uh, optimizer, and then uh, find the, uh, the optimum set of parameters that minimizes the energy. Okay, so I think I will hand over to you for the last slide. Yeah, so I, I think it's you know, fair to say we were able to experiment on real hardware with something that we had worked on previously only in simulation. Um, the advancements of the INQ suite that handled some of the optimizations for running on the actual chip got us further along than, than what we would, had really expected to be able to do on hardware today. And um, you know, again, we're learning insights and, and running some more experiments here. And, uh, working on a paper to actually talk about some of the more details of the results, but we thought that this audience would find it you know, fascinating that uh, there's a workflow that's available, there's access to running on real world devices today, and, um, and that the optimizations and specializations for those devices can have a profound impact on, on what you're able to do.